Greek democracy, art, and architecture is the topic of today, so let's get started. Now, democracy, if you do not know, it started in Athens. So you need to know the city of Athens, Athens, Greece. Now, I have to kind of set up the background, the context of democracy and understanding why this is such a powerful idea. Obviously, we know democracy started in ancient Greece, specifically in the city-state of Athens, but uh, we kind of understand it comes and we have a democratic system today in America, but you're going to see some similarities and differences from the way it worked back then and the way it works today. Now, the first difference that we have to understand is that this de uh, democracy that we had was called a radical democracy um, or a direct democracy. Direct democracy. We do not have this, uh, by and large, in the U.S. today. Um, let me explain. In the U.S., we have what we basically call a democratic republic. Now, democratic means you basically go and the people get to speak for themselves. A republic, though, is something that we did not have in Greece. We're going to later have this in Rome. A republic is where you go and elect people to represent you. For instance, in California, if we have laws that we're voting on, um, I myself do not get to vote on most of the laws. There's rare exceptions like a proposition on a ballot. But basically in California is I have elected people that ideally represent my um, beliefs and they are in Sacramento voting on those laws. Same with the U.S. as a whole. We send people in the House, in the Senate, hopefully representing uh, our interests as well. That's a Republican nature. Now, if you go back to ancient Greece, it did not happen that way. What happened was it was a direct democracy, meaning the people themselves want, went and uh, were able to go and vote. So let me break down where the word democracy comes from. Um, the word democracy comes from the, the first part comes from demos, which is people, and then kratos, which is power or grip. So literally the people have the power. Now I have to back up here a second and kind of, so you understand, um, this is not all people. So this excludes um, women, non-Athenian citizens, so like a foreigner, um, children, um, and some people can be taken away the right to vote. So uh, and it's also, you have to be male, basically, a male citizen that has served in the army and you're at least 30 years old. So it does limit it a bit. But with that said, where we're coming from of the systems of oligarchies, aristocracies, and tyrannies, um, this is quite an advance. Now, the three components that you need to know um, of democracy are the assembly, uh, the council of 500, and the courts. So I'll uh, start off with the assembly here. It's so important in Greece uh, for people to go and be involved in the democratic process. Our word, um, the word idiot, the insult idiot, actually comes from somebody um, that does not take interest in politics. Um, a supposed quote from uh, Pericles, who's a famous Greek, he said, we do not say that a man who takes no interest in politics is a man who minds his own business. We say that he has no business here at all. So the idea was that you had to go and um, being involved in government was important. Now, the easiest way to do this was in the assembly with Ecclesia. Basically, what happened was a bunch of dudes would go on top of a hill called the Panix, which I'll show you, specifically 6,000 people, and they would go and vote on the important issues of the day. Um, the way it worked was there would be somebody go and speak on behalf of the particular bill, and someone would also speak against it, and then the men would go and be able to vote, usually, usually with a raise of hands. If it was a very close vote or something like that, they've been known to maybe pass on black or white stones, and they toss the stones into um, basically a little jar, and then they count them up at the end. But if it's obvious uh, by a raise of hands, then the bill becomes a law. So this is just normal people. 6,000 guys get up to the top of a hill, and you have to be one of the first 6,000. There's a red rope with paint on it, and if you get the paint, you get a fine. So you have to, if you get the paint on your clothes, I should say, you got a fine. So uh, you had to make sure you're one of the first to get up to the top of the hill, and you actually got paid for the day, um, which is kind of cool. They held uh, different meetings throughout the year, um, depending upon, and initially they started off at 10, and then they moved up to like 40. Um, and they would go and vote on all these different types of laws. Now, the second part is the Council of 500, or the Boule. Now, the Council of 500, um, if you can't tell, had 500 people. If you know what Cleisthenes did, he divided up Athens into 10 different tribes. Each of these 10 tribes had 50 people representing them. 10 times 50 is 500. The Council of 500 is essentially their executive branch. They'll help to go um, and implement the laws to some extent. In addition to that, they're going to prepare the agenda of what the Ecclesia will be voting on. The uh, presidency of the Boule rotated monthly, so every month it would go and uh, change among one of the 10 tribes. And then the uh, leader of the Boule for the day 
um, was selected by lot. What you'll see is a, a, the word lot, L-O-T, or basically lottery random, was very, very popular um, kind of system because it was seen as fair. There's, an evident, there's evidence that um, one quarter of citizens might have been the president of the boule at some point because it rotated every day, which is kind of cool. Um, so their job is basically prepare the agenda for the ecclesia. It's just down the hill from the Pnyx. And then the third part uh, is the court system. Now, the court system is similar-ish to today, the idea that you have a plaintiff and defendant and a jury, um, but here's where it gets a bit different. The juries tend to be very, very large, um, uh, usually a minimum of 200 people, sometimes up to 500 people, sometimes even larger than that. Um, you would go in a water clock. You would go and represent yourself, and you would have until the water clock water ran out, depending upon the case. You had a different amount of time. And then the, uh, the two sides would speak. There's no lawyers, no judge. The jury can get a bit rowdy, so they can start yelling at you if they think you're uh, you know, lying or not. And then you're going to go, um, and the jury will vote. Uh, the jury will vote. Um, that day, it's very efficient in the sense that everything's over in a day. Um, you hear both sides. The jury votes uh, the testimony, and they also decide the punishment, um, if any, within that same day as well. So it's a very, very um, kind of uh, efficient type of um, system. Now, the office holders themselves, there were office holders that ran the government because you obviously have these three different um, components, and the question is, like, who's going to run it on the day-to-day? -day? Um, those were usually chosen by lot which sounds a bit scary to have just random people running the government, but there were some checks. Let me give you some of the checks. Um, one of the checks was you had to basically put your name to be in the lot, so people who want to be involved in running whatever um, type of function it is. Uh, two, they would go and basically there was a screening process and other things as well as people knew who you were, so there was kind of a moral and societal check as well, and they would also review your perf performance. The only positions that were not chosen by a lot, important positions, were two positions, the treasurer, somebody in control of the money, and the generals. There's 10 generals from the 10 tribes. Those were chosen for their experience. And both of those make sense. And that's where the famous General Pericles came from, um, who's very important later in Athens. Now, the guy basically usually credited with um, really implementing the, the style of democracy that we're uh, familiar with. His name is Cleisthenes, so you need to know him. They also had a lovely, lovely system uh, which we should bring back, which is called ostracism. You may have heard the term ostracize, and let me teach you the origin of the world, word. Uh, ostracize means to exclude somebody, right? You've probably heard that before. Now, ostracism was a political way to exclude somebody. Um, if the ecclesia wanted to, they could choose to ostracize somebody once a year. They were basically around town. They didn't have uh, paper wasn't readily available. They had broken pieces of pottery. These were called the ostraca. And if you did not like somebody, you would carve, basically, your, uh, their name into the Ostraka. And if somebody had enough votes, they would be kicked out of the city for 10 uh, years. They couldn't come back. They had 10 days to live, leave the city. If they tried to come back, they would have been um, dead. All their property did remain. And supposedly, if they did come back, they were supposed to not be stigmatized. They're supposed to be able to come back um, as a kind of a free citizen. I don't know exactly how much that happened. The assembly could also recall some people from being ostracized if they found out they needed them, which happened as well. Now, the question you might be asking is, why Why would somebody be ostracized? Um, the, ob the obvious one is you could just not like somebody. And there's a couple of instances of somebody just the somebody not being popular in town and they kicked him out. One of the funnier stories is a guy kind of had the title, The Just. And uh, an illiterate man was voting to ostracize this man named The Just. And he turns to a guy next to him and he says, how do you spell that? Because I don't know how to. Little do you know he's talking to the guy that was called The Just which is a little bit embarrassing. And the just, he said, why are you voting um, for this guy? And he says, I don't like the nickname. He sounds a little arrogant. So kind of a funny story. Also, what would happen, maybe there are um, different groups getting a little bit too contentious and they want to kick somebody out, um, help fizzle down the city. Um, in the early days, maybe they're uh, scared of a aristocracy or tyranny coming back. So those are all reasons as well. Now here's a picture of the Penix. Obviously didn't have... Uh, chairs back then, and you can see the Acropolis there in the back, which we'll talk about in a sec. Here's some discussion going on regarding um, democracy, all that fun stuff. Now, moving on to their architecture and art. The Athenians, as well as the rest of the Greeks, love beauty, both written and visual, which we'll see in their artwork. The idea of perfection and excellence, the concept of arete, which we've discussed before. Now, the earliest form of Greek statues does not look Greek. 
if I were to show most people these statues and said, what ancient civilization did this most likely come from? Most would probably guess Egypt. And these are called the, the style statue is called the Koros or Korai. Um, and that's a great guess um, because there's likely a heavy Egyptian influence in these statues. Um, they were likely dedicated to the god Apollo. And then also there's some evidence that they're on top of graves as well. Now, what I mean by this evolution point is we go, if you're into sculpture, um, I can't sculpt for anything, but if you're going to go make a sculpture, this would be the simplest type, the most basic type of human sculpture. Um, because it's symmetrical, there's not much movement, and the Greeks are known for going and perfecting the beauty of the human um, form in the style of art. So we're going to go from this to our next slide where we take a look at very, very um, advanced Grec uh, Greco, not Roman yet, but Greek art. Now, what we see here with this style is uh, something that we call humanism. This comes into play in the Renaissance later. But the idea of going and glorifying humans, and humans have value and worth. And if you're going to make something this long, it's going to take a long time for this to make. Um, it has uh, some value, some aesthetic value, some spiritual value. A lot of times these are the, of their gods and goddesses, which makes sense because if that's important to you. You're going to make that type of sculpture. Um, and one of the most amazing things, if you ever go see these uh, Greek statues up close, is the, the, the clothing, the way it drapes and falls is just absolutely astounding. What I mean by lifelike but not realistic is that they do have, uh, they do, they look like they could have life. They look like they could kind of come alive. But they're realistic in the fact that these bodies are perfect. There's no blemishes. There's no imperfections because that's what the standard was for um, that kind of excellent Greek body of a god or goddess, essentially, which just is not realistic. Not people's bodies don't aren't perfect, but that standard is certainly there with Greece. Now let's do a little tour around the city. Um, you've seen the Agora before the marketplace. I'll show you what the Stoa looked like, these st colored col columns, the origin of our gym where people work out, and then the theater as well. Here's the Agora. It was the marketplace. I've talked about this before in the previous video, so take a little look um, if you forget. Now, these Stoas are these long covered um, columns, basically. Um, you may have seen it before. You just didn't know the name. Gymnasium, where they get their workout on. Obviously, the word, the modern origin of what we say, going to the gym. And the theater, which if you uh, would like to learn more about the Greek theater, a lot of cool info, watch my Greek theater video. Now the columns. Now you're going to love this because this is one of those things that you're going to start noticing and you're going to be like, it's really nerdy, but you're going to go and kind of get a little bit excited. And you're like, oh man, Mr. Hurdle made me learn these. Um, the three Greek orders of columns. Okay, what you're going to look here at are these top, top parts, what we call basically the capital. Capital means head or top. So there's three types, basically named after the people, the region, the Doric, the Ionic, and the Corinthian, like Ionia is a region, Corinth is a place, um, Doric, the Dorians were the people. Um, so it goes from least, um, or the earliest, to more advanced from, as we move right, and also kind of more intricate. So the Doric's the most basic, the Ionic has the little scrolls there, and the Corinthian has the flowers, um, the much more intricate of the three. So when you start going, looking around town, you're going to start seeing that most columns fit into these three. There's some Roman columns as well, but you're going to be uh, nerded out when you go and see all these columns. Now the Parthenon. What type of column? You can see it there. If you said Doric, you're my friend because you just spotted a Doric column, which would make you think it's probably relatively early in Greek history. Um, now the Parthenon, everybody's seen this building. You've seen a picture of it. It's in the movies, all this stuff. So I'm going to talk a bit about why it's famous, what it was, all that stuff. Now, the Parthenon is on top of a hill with a bunch of other stuff. This part of the hill is called the Acropolis. Now, acro means high, polis means city, right? So it means high part of the city, like acrobat. So it's on the high part of the hill. And on the Acropolis, there's a bunch of other um, temples and stuff dedicated to different gods and goddesses. There's a couple theaters. But on the very top, the most famous part is the building called the Parthenon. Now, we just have to talk about, if I were, some people just don't realize what it was for, it was a temple dedicated to Athena. So it's a Greek temple, Athens, Athena. Now, when you go and look at the Parthenon, it's famous for a lot of different uh, reasons. Back then it was famous. I mean, it was famous today, but it was also famous back then. It was a point of pride. Um, the amount of care, the amount of structure, uh, just the sheer size of the structure. It was begun by Pericles and took about 14 years to build. And some of the cool things I'll talk about here now. Um, with the Parthenon, it's actually uh, built 
If you build um, parallel lines, supposedly they look curved to the human eye, kind of an optical illusion. They actually have all of these different columns curve in, all these Doric columns curve in. If you were to extend these up a mile into the sky, they would actually touch. They all curve inward a bit. Um, the amount of mathematics in that type of thing is, is really astounding. Now, in addition to this, it's with a lot of controversy. And that's what I'll talk about here in a second. The Greek government's been going and rebuilding the Parthenon. They're not going to rebuild it completely. And I'll talk about why it was destroyed. So this, you can pause here, this gives you a good idea of kind of in its glory days what the Acropolis looks like. It did not look like that, um, doesn't look like that today, but it's certainly worth a visit. This is what it looks like today. Um, it's still really, really uh, neat to go to. And if you don't make it to Athens, that's a bit too far for you in California, you can always go to Nashville where they have a full-size replica of the good old Parthenon. And in inside... Uh, in inside, that doesn't make sense, but inside, sorry. Uh, inside, there is a statue of Athena, which was in the original uh, Parthenon. You know Phidias, he's the guy that helped design a lot of this Parthenon stuff. It's known for its size, its proportion, the t concept you may have learned in geometry of the golden ratio. That's always been something thrown around about that the Parthenon has the perfect um, ratio, the golden ratio. Now, on the uh, pediment, the pediment, these are technically what that is in the building, is this like triangular shape thing there's on both sides now on the east side it shows the famous story of the birth of athena and then on the west side it shows the struggle you probably heard this story before between uh poseidon and athena and they're both fighting over basically who's going to be like the ruler of the city and athena is going to go and win poseidon tries you can see him there with the trident um poseidon goes tries to win but he uh gives them water but he's the god of the sea so it's salty so they don't like him now this history, uh, the building itself is just astounding, but the history, in my, in kind of my opinion, is even more astounding. Um, it's become, it's served three different religions, essentially. The ancient uh, Greco-Roman polytheistic religion for Athena. Then it later became a church in the Middle Ages. Think about that. They converted into a church. Just uh, strange. And then later, um, it gets taken over by the Ottoman Turks, and it becomes a mosque. So it becomes for Islam, and they actually install a minaret, which is where, we'll learn about this in Islam, but that's where they do the call to prayer from, inside the Parthenon. It's crazy. Now, the Greeks get taken over by the Ottomans, and they're going to fight the Venetians, like from Venice, you know, Italy. And they ha somebody comes up with a really smart, um, I'm being sarcastic here, smart idea to go put gunpowder, use the gunpowder powder storage inside the Parthenon. And a direct cannonball hit on the Parthenon, explodes the gunpowder, the roof explodes, that's why the roof's not there. And it kind of falls into a lot of disrepair. Then the controversy here. In the 1800s, um, British people, it becomes like the cool thing of the day to go and, and be into Greek culture. And Lord Elgin goes over and buys from the uh, Ottoman government, who's in control of the Greeks at the time, a bunch of the Parthenon marbles. And he brings them back, and eventually they end up in the British Museum. Now, the controversy today is that the Greeks want them back, the British won't give them back, similar to the Rosetta Stone, which is also in the British Museum, and all that good stuff. Where do they truly belong? The Greeks have now built the Parthenon Museum. Uh, we have this discussion in class because it's a really interesting uh, type of topic. And as Americans, some people say, why do I care? But it's very, very important to understand that type of global, global um, perspective. So this is a shot inside the British Museum of the, uh, the marbles that essentially he took home with him. So, Greek democracy, art and architecture, uh, three of my favorite topics.